Hi boys and girls, lads and lasses, welcome back to another Wednesday night movie and tonight it is The Sting, 1973's The Sting, starring Robert Redford and Burt Reynolds, but I keep on going to say Burt Reynolds, why do I keep on doing that? I don't know. I have, not... I've been doing that all day, I've every single time I've said it, I've said Burt Reynolds instead of Robert Redford and Paul Newman. Don't know why I've been doing it, and it is really annoying me because three times I was talking to my wife about the movie, and I kept saying Burt Reynolds. I'm going, well, and I it just basically, I don't know why. Maybe it was just one of those movies that I was expecting him to be in it. I don't know where it came from because it's not. I definitely not a bandit movie. Mm. Although there are a bunch of bandits at some point. <laughs> But it's just, I don't know why I've been saying that all day. And the great <laughs> Robert Shaw. Yeah. Before pretty the shot. Yeah, aye. pretty shot. Before the shot. <laughs> got to him. Aye. Yeah, the problem was, do you, do you know what would make this movie better? Predator. No, a shark. No, a predator. A, <laughs> a predator shark. shark. <laughs> a predator shark. <laughs> There were multiple sharks in this movie. Oh, I there definitely was. Yeah, like, yeah. for instance, the assassin. Yep. She was Oof. very shark like. Um, you just wouldn't yeah. expect her, would you? There no. was a lot of it you don't expect because you're expecting one type of movie and then it implements other parts within it. And you're sitting there thinking, didn't expect that. And then you're sitting there thinking, oh, this is going to happen. And then it didn't. <laughs> but that's what we're seeing. I mean, we were seeing in the back is basically mm. there's Jim. Hey, Jim. I, I, I think this one is one of these movies that nowadays it is a a Hollywood trope to subvert your expectations. Oh yes. Whereas this did it and did it in such a good way that even though you've watched it multiple times, you pick up the things and you're sitting waiting to see where they tie off and you realise you actually did see them the first time um, because they were so well done that you were expecting things to happen and then to be found out that they actually did happen you just didn't notice them mm-hmm. because it was all part and parcel of the story it was really, yeah. really well done so it was yeah, it's a really well done film with yep. lots of surprises, and you have to pay attention. Oh, mm-hmm. you you, yeah. you cannot ignore this film. You have to watch it, listen to it, and understand everything they're saying, and then pay attention to mannerisms and yeah. body languages and the the whole thing. And just think, this was filmed before CGI. Oh uh, yes, and didn't the the Roaring Twenties, Thirties, Roaring Twenties look legit? They do a good approximation, but this is still seventies interpretation of what they. Uh, thought of course, it is. is but you think right. about it, if they did the interpretation now, you would see the same type of cars. You would see the right. same type of things ha- happening, and. It would be all CGI in the background to make it all look bigger. Whereas this, they actually filmed in parts where it was quite wide open and it looked the part. Mm-hmm. I mean, the amount of cars that was there, the amount of people they had, the extras around, even when they were doing it, and they, you could see right down the street, it was just the long. Obviously, where it was filmed, um, we remember, we, we recognize bits where it was filmed from things like The Warriors Under the Bridge or. Yeah. That type of thing, but even when they were filming it, it just looked the time period looked right. Mm-hmm. Especially being set in the era of the Great Depression, where everybody was like, you know, trying to make money in some way or form just to feed themselves or their families. And you but think it, about it uh, as well. It was such a a typical time that they had yeah. grifters and they were yep. gangs of grifters. And they were basically, it's no, I suppose like now, where you've still got con men, but they're all online doing the stuff and it's redefined. But then, mm. Gifters were just on, always on the con. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's, uh, 
1936. It specifically mentions yep. in the beginning September of 1936. So September the 14th or something like that, wasn't it? Yeah, but, yeah. Uh -huh. 1936. But as I'm saying, the time frame it looked throughout. It's it's not like they had one car and you would see the same car parked different places. It just yeah. looked correct. Yeah, and there uh, were so many cars. Yeah, yeah, so, about that, that, uh, about the cars. Uh -huh. Yeah, the T4 was literally the biggest thing around at this time, but they had so many different models of the T4. Yeah. You had the sloped back, you had the square back, you had the little what was the, the horse and carriage looking one. Yeah. And okay. they managed to get hold of all of these models just for this film. Mm. Uh huh. Uh, and it was it was just so well done because it's no it, it I never threw out this whole movie anytime they were doing street scenes. I felt like I was watching UFO. Where they've got two cars and everybody seems to be driving the same two cars. I know. Yeah, you know I mean, <laughs> whereas this one, different scenes, you wouldn't yeah. see the same car twice unless the person, like for instance, the the bit where they got up to the FBI, and they've got the big long Model T, which I found yeah. weird because it's pissing the rain and they leaned out the window to open the doors, which means there's no windows in those ones, and I'm sitting. Is that actually true? Because if it's pushing the rain, I wouldn't want to be sitting in the back. At least the guys in the front had windows around them. The guys in the back didn't because they had to lean out the window. And it was, there was no glass. It was just open top. Hmm. So bugger that in the snow, bugger that in the rain. And, <laughs> it, and then the next time you see them get up to the same place and then he's, he's hmm. arrested. And it's the two F it's the FBI agent driving it again. So when it's in the same place, it's the same people driving it. So it's not like the same car and there's different people driving it just to make it look different. Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, I've got to say about the filming is that this it wasn't actually filmed in Chicago except for Union Station. But some areas were filmed in Santa Monica and the Universal Studios back lots. Plus, well, the we Universal were... Studio backlog is a yeah. uh, any time they were doing the, the the cafe and stuff like that because they yeah. used to have the big street and the Universal backlot. So that I I could understand because any time they was like they were doing the shooting scenes and the running around mm -hmm. the corner at that one cafe, it was all happened round about that one diner. Yeah, I thought that was a studio set in the old Universal Studios where they had the they used to have the the two or three streets interlocked so they could actually film like that. But it was still it looked the part. Yeah. And as I said, I watched this twice. I've watched it multiple times. I've enjoyed it each time. But see, when I sat down to watch it again, I, I, as soon as it finished, I just put it back on. <laughs> just because I, I enjoyed it that much, I thought, this is a lot better than I remember. And I enjoyed it when I think I thought back about it. I thought, great movie. I can't wait to watch this again. Then watched it and thought, I'm going to watch that again. It was that good. Mm -hmm. One of those things uh, just made my, it made it perfect. A nice day, considering that I had a lot of work today, and I I caught a bit of it yesterday and finished it off and rewatched it. It was great. I just got to remember they did have an intermission in this film, didn't they? Sequence because I know they had the title cards, like you know about the setup, <laughs> you know the con and everything. But didn't they have an intermission sequence? I don't know. I because I never saw it in the cinema. I never saw it in the yeah. cinema. But, I don't know if I remember really, but uh, and uh, Roman, get back to work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this has got to be some of the snappiest dialogue. This whole yeah. period in, in Hollywood, too. The dialogue was getting oh. so good. Yeah. But, but you it, think about it, they were actually in the 30s and they didn't they fear using negative words. Yes. And it, as even um, Robert Earl Jones, James Earl mm. Jones' father. Yeah, you know I mean, mm. he used that about himself because it was a, a, of its time. You you look at that. That is a movie there where. 
they didn't you can't say it it was very diverse. You hmm. can't say it because obviously there was a couple of coloured characters, but at the beginning it showed that people the people who didn't care didn't care. It was just they were all just friends and mm -hmm. treating each other like family. And then you had the outsiders who used the N-word because that was just what they did. It yeah. wasn't a case of they thought any less because they, they didn't treat the, the the black guy, even though he got murdered, any less than they were going to treat the white guy. They were going to murder him and he just got away because he obviously, he was younger, he didn't have a family to stay around. So it was very good watching it and seeing... Actually, Robert Earl Jones. Um, yeah, I'd watched this multiple times. I didn't realise that was who it was until obviously doing it for the review. When I'm actually looking at some of the extra cast, I just thought, "Wow." You know what I mean? Yeah, it's, it's I love me. that they showed his whole family. Yes. Yeah. That, that Redford's character. Like Francis, yeah, I used to grift for him and I used to do this and he was never as good with me. Right, get your coat on, we're going to church. <laughs> yep. <laughs> then the, yeah, and the little punk kid is like, yeah, mom, I don't want to. But, you know, hey, mom's going to say, mom's going to do. And can you look in on the little ones while I'm gone, too? You know, like uh, it, it, it was mm. just such a great yeah. setup for the family. And to remind the audience, the whole revenge plot was to was for that I family. Think, Yes, yeah, uh -huh. and as they said, they were talking to right, um, they went in to try and get a crew. And he says, after what happened to Leo, and I can't get more, I can't guarantee more than two, three hundred people. They're all basically he was saying that everybody will want in on this, oh, yeah, because of what they did to their friend. And it was, it was showing you the family and the relationship between the group as in all the grifters in the area so grifters got to grift but they all looked out for each other that's right yep. uh -huh. and that's, that's what right. it was so there's, a, there's, a, there's a family that everybody loved and they were part of the family they were mm. treated as part of the family and then when something happened to them or yet they, they were saying Aye, they put a big uh, uh, a hat round to get something for the kids and then they went for the revenge for him as well, yep. it's just I like the opening uh, where you show the con how it's done, or mm -hmm. like rolling up those notes, stuffing it yeah. down your and you know, and swapping it around. That was absolutely brilliant. You mean this one? Let us see if I've got it. Um, I, I, I have got it. The, the grift. Yeah. I I because I've actually <laughs> loaded some bits and pieces up on for later on so let's see if i can show the grift my mouse is jumping all over the bloody place every time i actually go to do it and it's there i get you some day for this sucker egg no one get away he's got my wallet where are you he's got all my money my wallet we he's got, got my wallet. wallet we got it Give what happened? Me. Give it to me, please. Enter with a knife. I used the title, man. You need a doctor. I'll call a cop. No, 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 no cops. You want about the law or something? No, it's okay. Are you nuts carrying a water around like that in a neighborhood like this? No, what do you got yet? Thanks. I'm obliged to you. I gotta get going. Ah! You ain't going nowhere. Oh, I got him. Gotta run some slops down in West Bend for a mob here. I got a little behind in the field. So they think I've been holding out on them. They gave it to the four to come up with the cash. They don't get it. I'm dead. Hey, don't look good, Gramps. It's almost four now. I'll give you and your friend a hundred bucks to deliver it for me. I don't know. That mug that hit you is mad enough at me already. Well, what if he's running a corner waiting with some friends? You don't know you're carrying it. Come on, you've got to help me out. Hey, I'm sorry, Tom. I'm going to maybe help you get it fixed up, get it to a doctor, but I ain't about to walk it in on a knife for you. How about, How about you? you? All, All you got to do is put it in the nose slot. I'll give you the whole hundred. Hey, what, what makes you think you can trust him? He didn't do shit. Hey, hey buy out chicken liver. I came, came back a wallet, didn't I? <laughs> How hard is this? Thing? H. Galata <laughs> Mason. Put it in box three C's. They so won't have no trouble. There's five thousand dollars there, and here's a hundred bucks to you. Okay, old man, I'll make it right for you. And don't worry, you can trust me. 
Hey, hey, if those goons decide to search you, you ain't gonna get far carrying it there. What, what do we do? do? You got a bag or something? How about a hanky? Yes, I can just. Okay, give it to me. Give me the money. Yes, sir, will you? You got any more? Better give it all to me if you want to keep it. They think I've been holding out on them. My well, wife got sick and I had to pay the bill. I wasn't holding out on him. I always been looking at the money before. Like this guy. Uh -huh. Hi, yeah. will you? Ain't a tough guy in the world that's gonna frisk you there. Thanks, yeah. Where to? Which way is me? Twenty blocks out. Okay, go north. Go to the station. Back. Right. <laughs> What's so funny? I just made the world's easiest five grand. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> I, and I even liked throughout this, that was the grift, that one. The mm. very the start, obviously I cut the very first part of it out. Didn't want to actually have them using certain language. Yeah. On the channel. <laughs> Don't want to be kicked. But it was the fact is, I loved throughout the setup, the sting, uh, uh, yeah. the setup, the players, you know what I mean? The shutout, and they would tell you what's happening mm. for each section. Mm -hmm. Which I thought were really good, and I, it was just well done. Whoever yeah. actually directed it and produced it, they, they basically cut it in such a way they can actually they don't the story flows. You did do no. bits that was telling you, but the fact that they did do bits that were telling you, it was almost like you were watching a stage play. As it were. Yeah, it was directed by George Roy Hill, who also do, do, did Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid. Mm -hmm. So it was just so well done, I think. Uh, yeah. Even the, the display of it and actually giving you the step by step mm -hmm. what's happening throughout. Especially when they went after uh, Robert Shaw's character, especially when they met him on the train. Uh -huh. you know, and Paul Newman's acting as, like, had to. Pretend he was drunk and all this and that and try and, you know, cheat at the card game. Yeah. <laughs> That's one thing you never had these days is a card game on the train. Yeah, and that was the train cars we've got. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. There's Although, very few trains nowadays that have got the individual yep. carriages, as it were. Hmm. Where you go in and there's a door for the it's the corridor. The old fashioned carriages where each door went in, there was six or eight seats, and there was only one mm -hmm. corridor down the side. Don't get that anymore. Which is a shame. Now it's just basically open and everybody just sits. But then again, it's out in numbers, isn't it? Yep. Uh -huh. but, oh. um one thing I do want uh, want to raise is how this where you had the whole setup of them creating this idea of a story mm -hmm. and going along with it about you know betting on horses it's it's just absolutely unique of like every bit of detail's gone into this yeah because they told you Learned why it, yeah. it had to yeah. be the cards and the horses because yeah. it wasn't just a case of like, we'll do this, do this, do this, and we'll get him in and this. Yeah. Then there's the guy saying, no, he doesn't drink, no, he doesn't actually do this, no, he doesn't actually do this. Yeah. And he, he's no interest in that, and he only plays this and that. And then they say, cards, but he cheats. Uh -huh. Especially setting up an underground betting shop, or going all that way out just to set that up for this guy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they said it wasn't expensive. Yeah, and they were hiring. It's the fact is they went to another grifter to hire yeah. equipment. What is it you're on? Yeah. Right, okay, you pay for <laughs> it. Was, there's a place you can go for a grift just to get <laughs> hire the, the stuff you want. Then you get yeah. it all back, the suits and everything. So there's somebody actually that you think in the background being the li <laughs> their library, their pawn shop. 
it's just the, the whole idea of it is is ridiculous, but yeah. it's so fun. It, it's well done. Can, can we mention one character, Charles Duran's ca- character, the uh, corrupt police detective? Mm. Uh-huh. <laughs> oh, it, he, he was like trying to steal the entire film, the way he, you know, the way he just come, came in. And yeah. he still hasn't got a clue until we met the FBI and they said, no, this is higher than you think. Yeah. Sit down and shout, will you? Try not yeah. to live up to all my expectations. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as soon as you mentioned that, I remembered I had put a banner and it had yeah. a bit about him on it with the FBI. And especially with the FBI, well, the fake FBI, wearing those hats. Aye, the, the straw hats. Yeah. yeah. That was the part I was sitting there thinking, that's a, that's a typical trope. Because you look at other movies of the same genre, no, yep. uh, sorry, the same time frame, like for instance, The Untouchables. Mm. Right. That was uh, all the guys wore the Trilbies. You look at a lot of movies, uh, Casablanca, Trilbies, and, yeah. and it was always some type of hat like that. Very rarely you would see, you would see the Harold Lloyd type, you would see occasional, but you would never see a group. And it was all the straw hats. That was to me. That was a very Hollywood trope of how hmm. the FBI of that age would dress up, because the in reality they would. <laughs> I'd be like wearing a uniform. I know. <laughs> but the about fifty of them, they're all wearing the exact same hat. And, and the thing is, they're not actually operating in a proper office. They're operating in like an abandoned factory or something. Uh-huh. Right. Yeah. So why would they actually highlight the fact they're all wearing the same yeah. outfit as if they're agents? It, it was a wee bit silly, but that trope sort of worked on it because they, it was not a case of they were actually representing the FBI. They were just representing what the flat foot people yeah. expected of the FBI. So right. they could go over the top. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it'd be like um, as someone wanted to pretend to be a, a police officer in the 70s, they would walk about how they would expect police officers to walk about so they would be recognised. So mm. like if they were in plain clothes, they would be walking around maybe with the suit on just because that's what people expect. So they'd have a suit and a trench coat and people would just look at them and think, police even though they're not, and they're just what you pretend to be, but they, they're doing it pretend to be as if they are not. That's So I suppose the trope worked for that because that's what they were wanting him to think with the way they were dressed. So it was always part of the con. The con is so obvious sometimes when you look at it, but you want it to be obvious. You want people to think, nah, it wouldn't be that ridiculous. <laughs> It, it, nobody could do that. That's that's just ridiculous. It must be true. Mm. <laughs> so mm. I think that's so. When I saw that part, I thought Hollywood trope. But if you're trying to convince someone you're a FBI agent, you would dress up as how people think FBI agents dress up as. Right. Yep. Now I just want to bring out uh, Doyle Doyle Lonergan, Robert Shaw's character. Yep. He had to remain, he had to go to the drugstore across the road just to wait for a phone call. Yeah. You know, and I thought, that's, I've, I've never really seen a drugstore until I watched that film. No, I, I'd, I'd seen them in a, a lot of early ones. You think, you think yeah, about Casablanca, there was always, or, or, that, te- or, or that genre, there would be people in yeah. the, the, old co- uh, the old Humphrey Bogart movies. They would be in a drugstore sitting um, then having a coffee, and then the phone would go, and that would be what they were doing. So I I, I, remember, I, I grew up with watching all the old comfortable mm. that movies and stuff like that. So, yeah. But it, it was just great is that they had to play it first before he had to make the gamble with a lot of money later on. Yeah. Right. Really get a hold of it. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, um, I just jumped in. But there was a lot of uh, department stores and and drug stores that had a restaurant or at least a soda fountain. Yeah, yeah. As part of the establishment, then of course telephones because 
I mean, imagine it was uh, probably. I'm trying to think of what the um, what the similarity to today would be. It's almost like we have these places in the U.S. called uh, City, um, and they're a division of Target. Mm -hmm. And inside of this smaller size Target, there's a little tiny restaurant. There's a Starbucks, right? There's a there's a bunch of places uh, that you can go. There's Back in the day, there used to be internet in these things, right? There'd be like a little Wi-Fi zone you could go into. So yeah. that's about as close to it as we get nowadays. But back in yeah. the day, it would have – it would be a one-stop kind of thing. You'd yeah, stop we, in there have, and get everything you need. Yeah, we would – We, I suppose we would have had them. Things like you would have gone into Goldberg's, Woolworth's, uh, stuff like that. The old right, shops right. here, and they would, they would all have a cafe. I yep. suppose nowadays you have a couple of stores still have cafes, but they're all self-serve stuff, whereas there you would have had a cafe. You'd go and sit down, somebody come out, take your order, bring it to the table. Now it's just a, you go along with your own tray, fill it up in a way. So they're not the same type of cafes. Right. So we've not right. got anything like we used to, but we never had what you collect, like the Laurel and Hardy, the soda fountain, um, or... Wonderful Life, the soda fountain, or the cafe, that type of thing, the Back to the Future type of establishments. We never had anything like that, but we all yeah. understand it because of watching American movies growing up. Right. However, even here, the things we did have, just not around anymore. And if they are, they're a patch in what they used to be. I didn't know that about the... Gwyndorf Brothers, actual Conman and Chicago in the 20s, so obviously that's where they got Doyle's um, Harvey's name from. Hmm. They must have used it. They had to have used it from that. Hey, Keely. But they, they, if, they've, they, if they're in the Chicago's in the 20s, there were two brothers known as Conman and they used Harvey Gwyndorf. It has to be the... the uh, homage to that surely. probably yeah and these guys definitely brought a sense of like the robin hood genre yep yep and uh robert shaw's character god talk oh. about a guy capable this guy mounted so much dislike to him right i mean robert shaw was doing a lot of the heavy lifting and because they're all, all of these characters are scoundrels, right? I mean, we yep. can agree on that. They're all scoundrels at the very yep. least. So Robert Shaw had to make it so that he was an uber scoundrel. Otherwise, the whole film doesn't work. Yes. Uh, and the only thing about Robert Shaw's character I disliked was his limp. Sometimes it just looked too much, too artificial. Yeah. Hmm. But... And he hasn't even met the shark yet, so why has he got a limp? Yeah, <laughs> didn't take the bait off him. But it was, a, I suppose, who, whose idea was that? It would probably be his. He wanted to give him something. Here, I'm, I'm a hard man because I see it. Well, if I've got a limp, maybe that is a battle thing, and that's why I've got a limp, maybe because I had to fight my way up. So he's probably put that in for his character, you yeah. can imagine. Yeah. So... It annoyed me sometimes, especially when he's meant to be walking fast. He just see. Yeah, the old obviously made a comment about him. He's he, he's got the gimp. You know what I mean? The gimpy leg. Yeah, and the old way to do that was to put something in your shoe so that the limp would always be consistent. But uh, maybe he didn't go ahead with that. It was yeah. probably an acting thing that he added on, and just couldn't keep it consistent. Shot for shot. Yeah. It just, most of the times it, it looked okay and you hardly noticed it, but other times when he was meant to be moving fast, he just let, when he came down the stairs, the very first time he came down the stairs and he walked fast up to put the bet on, the, the limp just seemed a wee bit too pronounced for that, mm. which is just weird. Didn't he take from the, the movie at all? Yeah, at all. When was the first time you saw this movie, guys? Anybody see it in the cinema? No, no I, was, I wasn't even born yet. Not that I remember. I would have been 
eight. So uh, no. definitely not cinema, but it was definitely Betamax for me. It would have been on the TV yeah. or video. Yes. Yeah, I I agree with you there, PJ, because I watched this on TV, but it was like a Sunday afternoon type film. Yeah. Right, it would have been a Sunday afternoon type film. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. When the BBC and ITV put on decent movies on Sunday, so because you true. knew you were sitting about. Now they put on crap. Uh, yeah. And now they put yeah. on politicians in Australia actually eating bugs. <laughs> The one of the politicians here who, through his policies, killed thousands of people during the pandemic because he was wrong and he would he, he got things wrong and he didn't want to admit it, is now going on as I'm a celebrity, get me out of here. Uh, yeah, ju- ju- just to describe it for the, the American audi- audiences, we have a if you are someone of notoriety here in UK. You could be politician, you could be a famous like a journalist writing for Guardian I would or whatever not it say is. Politicians politicians like to think of themselves as a celebrity, but the politicians but, but was, they wasn't be. Anne Widdicombe. He had retired, this. she was an a retired politician. It's different. It, yeah, Anne but, Widdic- but it, it, even Widdic- so the level is you have to be someone that has had your name someone of note in public. Mm-hmm. And then you go to this Bear Grylls survival TV show in Australia where, where they, they put you in and... miserable, sweaty camp in the harshest season that the Australian uh, environment will give you. So it's like it's 39 Celsius at night time. And then they do challenges and everything. And if you want to stay on the show and be the winner, you have to go through. See on YouTube, type, so you... I, uh, on YouTube, type, I'm a celebrity. Get me out it, of here. That's it, what it's it, it, Exactly. But they get p- put through some really gruesome stuff. But it is the audience watching the show that says, oh, you're going to eat worms or you're going to eat these larvae. Uh, it's like baby worms or whatever it is. So the audience will literally send text messages into the TV show and tell what they have to do. Yeah. Hmm. It, it's they make, but one of the politicians, a sitting politician. Current yeah, sitting it's a politician. sitting politician who's an absolute plank. <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> He's, he, he decided to sign up for it. I don't know why, because he has a successful career. He's just literally living off taxpayers' money. He's got, what, 80 grand a year? 80,000 pounds a year? What, whatever it is that they're making. What the heck is he doing? So he's been suspended yeah. from his party because you're not allowed to do these things. If you're a serving politician. politician. Because he would have been out of the country for however long he get kept in for <clears throat> and stuff like that. So, but it was, but I don't even know why I went on to that because it's something. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> however. Back to him. Back to, film. Back to films. <laughs> right. I think I would have seen this. I, I was me because I said, yes, Sundays used to be good and said we the crappy programs with politicians. That was my fault. Yeah. I took us the squirrel route. So, <clears throat> back to the film. That's when I would have seen it. First, t- it would have been, I must have been, uh, I would have said I was probably in my late teens. So, you're talking about it would have been in the late 70s. So, it must have been about five, six years minimum after it was in the cinema when it was released. And movies usually were a couple of years after they'd been out of the cinema, they appeared on the TV. Yeah. That was always par for the course, not two, three weeks later. So what was the point actually going to the cinema if you could wait a couple of weeks and it would be on TV? Mm-hmm. But, and I remember watching it and just enjoying it. I didn't think about it. It was mm-hmm. just an enjoyable, enjoyable movie, enjoyable music. And I, I liked the idea of all these guys conning this guy who thinks he's better than everybody else and they were just bringing him down to the level. 
Yeah. I just like the idea of it, the, the revenge aspect of it as well. But the more I saw it, the more I appreciated it as I was growing older. But this weekend, this week, watching it, I just thought it was, it's far better than I remember. It yeah. proved, it improves with age. The more you watch it, the older you get, the more you appreciate things that are happening in it and you appreciate how things were done. Because no CGI, no special effects, apart from the silly ones that they showed you them doing themselves. Like, for instance, the blood when they get shot. You see him already putting the stuff in, ready for it to happen. And then right. when the other ones get shot and he's got the blood over, he, the first thing he does is takes a hanky out and rubs it, cleans his hand because obviously he's, as he got round it like that and splashed it onto it, so it made it so he looked as if he got shot. But it, and it wasn't a case of he did he looked down. He, he basically first thing he did clean his hand. So they're showing you how these tricks are done without actually telling you out loud that oh by the way. I better put this blood thing in to bite so when I get shot, I can bite it. Oh. Mm. Don't just put it in as part and mm. parcel of getting ready and then you work out later on, oh, that's what they're doing. And then when he takes his hand out and he wipes his hand, it's a case of why would they wipe his hand when he's standing up? It's, and then you realise that's because he's had to do that to splash whatever was in his hand to get the blood on his jacket. So he's cleaning it off. It's mm. subtle. Whereas nowadays, subtlety isn't a thing. This was done, everything it was done was subtle. And the thing, and the thing is, they didn't like check for bullet holes or anything like that. But the thing is, you look at a lot of the old TV yeah, programs, they I never know. did that anyway. It was always a blood splot. You yep. look at, at anything. So within the genre or the movie making thing, mm -hmm. that's how you would have seen it on the TV. So anything you would have seen they would have seen the guy would have fallen down and there wouldn't have been bullet holes in his back they would turn him over and it would be a bat of blood so they played into those tropes which worked but if you've got an fbi agent going oh he's dead you yeah go turn and say, could you confirm it because i don't really see anything you know what i mean he's yeah an fbi agent he said he's dead he's, do you believe him yeah when you're they told him going, let, let's think, will we wait here for the journalists in the real place to turn up, or will we take the FBI's <laughs> who we think well, is Well, yeah, but the way, the way they were trying to end it is where they say, right, you got to get out of it. You shouldn't be here, and they had to go quick. Right. That's the, that's the kind of thing. Right, yeah, the setup was that it, they had the excuse of a quick exit. Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, I, and you're right. I now I'm wondering if a con like this ever got pulled off back in 1936, how far would they actually go? Would they use little explosives in their suit? I mean, because mm. any mob guy who's ever seen anybody shot would know in a second that that guy was never shot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There was no spray. There was no hole. The amount of blood that comes out of a human being when they're all hyped up. Yeah. You could have said that for Harvey's character, but Johnny's yeah. character, no, because he got shot in the back and it was a small caliber gun. He had it was a it was a 22, wasn't it? It was just a wee a small because he pulled mm -hmm. put it in his waist. It was only a small revolver, so right. it'd be a 22. So but him coming towards him, getting shot in the back, yeah, you could see him going down, but yeah, there would no be no blood in his back in that respect, but that aspect of it and the other one he spun as he gets shot and he just had the as you said the red bullet hole but yeah anybody it, who was involved in me uh, a gangster, they would know the difference <laughs> right it, off. it gives me a tiny vibe even though it's very tiny but it gives me a vibe of bugsy malone ah actually it does give me more of a vibe because that's mm. exactly when i saw I'd seen Bugsy Malone in this probably, I'm trying to remember, Bugsy Malone was 78, wasn't it? Yeah. I think yeah. 76. 76. Something. So I'd seen Bugsy Malone before I saw this. So this right. gave me the vibe, and it actually, that's exactly what it reminded me of, the mob. Yeah, but, was, but Bugsy Malone for me as a kid, 
I mean, I, I, I've seen tons of these mobsters, mafias, gangsters films and everything. But mm -hmm. Bugsy Malone, Bugsy Malone, childhood memory, that is what stands out. Okay, get it that up. Okay, you, you get hit, you get smacked in the face by a pie. Yeah. And you're out. But that is the way you understood the world as a kid. It's like tag, you're it, or tag, you're out. Right. Yeah. And it, it this one brought that as an adult watching it now versus as a kid, because I as a kid I thought this film a lot more serious. But watching it back, I see so much of the comedy. Yeah. They're very, very light-hearted about this film. It has serious elements, but it's oh, light-hearted. Mm. Yeah, I wouldn't say it's comic. I wouldn't say it is um, violent. It is mm -hmm. a nice mix of, I suppose, soft entertainment where the violence parts of it are very minimal because they talk about violent things happening. Yeah, he was fine with a knife in his eye. So they talk about a mob hit, like the guy who got conned, the grift at the beginning. He never got on the trains because obviously he got the money stole, so he was scared. And then they found him and they says, yeah, he was found in a quarry with a knife in his eye. <laughs> so, I mean, it's basically, so they were giving you a very gruesome description mm. of how he died and yeah obviously you saw Leon getting uh, thrown out the window well at the bottom of the thing after getting thrown out a window after getting beaten up and then you see people getting shot you know what I mean and you see the pretend stab at the beginning so mm. there, there's a lot of violence but there's no graphic violence there's description of certain graphic violence violent aspects but, but it's not the untouchables that's all it's not the untouchables like. but it's not laugh out loud it's not comedy like Bugs and Malone mm. as we say where it's got a lot of laughter uh, comic, comic stuff in there there's humorous parts in it so I mean they class it as a comedy I would class it as humorous because the it is I wouldn't even say real life comedy it's just things that like they would have a laugh and a joke with each other or they would say things to each other that you go and you would have a smile at but that's what I'm just meaning about it. It's not it's a good soft entertainment or humorous entertainment but it's not a comedy mm. as such. Mm. Yeah, I was just looking at the clocking of uh, other films that were coming out around the same time period and because it this was a, a more wholesome version of a crime drama because mm -hmm. right around the same time period we've got the godfather in 1972 and the french connection in 1971 so this is almost like a response from hollywood like whoa guys we better tone it down a little bit i mean we got uh sonny Colleone getting chiseled to little bits in that toll booth yeah Right, and you got the French Connection. The poster is quite literally Gene Hackman shooting a bad guy in the back. So it's almost as if there were a few films coming out around this time that were trying to do, quite literally, an old timey Hollywood movie. I mean, it quite literally is an old timey Hollywood movie. Yeah, it is the the, the old gangster movie t trope where mm -hmm. like the twenties. So you didn't have like the. The nearest you got to it would be like the Valentine's Day Massacre. You had a lot of shooting and the thing, but even then, you just saw the bodies with bits of blood in it. You didn't see bits blown off, right? So it goes back to that with the violence, with the bits where the guy gets shot in the alley. You hear the, the two shots and he just spins round, and you know, and he lies, he lands in his stomach yeah. when he's meant to get shot. So they don't need to show any blood and guts and bits, pieces, holes in his body and stuff like that. They did what they used to do in the old black and white. Bang, bang, doom. He's dead. Yep. You want to check? Well, he's been mm. shot. He's dead. <laughs> right, <laughs> face down. Uh, yeah. So. I, just, I just want to bring up uh, Paul Newman's entrance. 
where they, yeah. he goes to meet, meet him for the first time and he's trying to find him and he's passed out. He's passed out against the door, against the wall with the nose. Yeah. yeah. Classic. Where is he? Instantly charming. <laughs> yep. Especially <laughs> where he picks up that block of ice and starts chiseling it. <laughs> Yeah, the old ice, ice blocks, ice freeze, freezers, where it's just basically a, a cupboard that you put the ice in the top. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> I had one of those in an old apartment around here. Yeah, I must admit, I never I never saw one except on the TV. Never, yeah. never saw one. <laughs> but it, it, it's also a, a thing there that I've not seen in recent films in maybe the last maybe 20 years. It's them daring to show the hero as someone that might be down and out on the luck. The only thing I can recall in the last 20 years is Cobra Kai, Johnny Lawrence. Yeah. Where, hmm. where he's literally like, oh, it's a half empty bottle of beer and he's like, ah, oh, it's breakfast. Um... And they, they, they don't do that kind of hey the, the 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 person you're supposed to be rooting for is literally down and out yes mm, i wouldn't have said they were down and out because a lot of them still had cars or a roof over their head and stuff like mm -hmm. that See, done the bit. They've had a few of those. I'm trying to remember the one. It was the, it was the um. Oh, what was it? It's the Mexican guy. I can't even remember. He's, he looks fucking tough every time you look at him. Any movies he's in, he's always Danny the Trejo. Uh -huh. Yeah, there was the one about him. Remember, he was just he was just a mechanic. He was basically just living to bring food into the house. But he used to be ex army, <laughs> and they basically he, he two guys, two skinheads attack him and try to record the attack. And he beats them up and steals the phone. And they get because <laughs> they were filming it live, so they two of them got ridiculed. And then they got him mm. back, and they basically the same thing happened because they just underestimated them each time. And it was that type of thing. So there has been movies like that, but. Mm. I suppose the difference is during the depression when they're actually you see go into their house, their house maybe let there's maybe the the parents in it, maybe four kids, grandparents, cousins, uncles, all st staying in the same house because yeah. the, uh, where there's a place for the family to be because they've not got the money for them all to have their individual rooms and I mean they all just basically cram into the house because at the time it was all about money so if you had six adults or eight adults in the house earning the little you could get at least it kept the roof over your head and food and heating so and how many jobs did they had to work back in them days uh -huh. if they were lucky to have those jobs yeah but that's what I'm saying so it always showed that but this one, I think, because you look at um, Robert L. Jones' characters, um, what was his? his oh, Luther. Luther. Mm. Aye. When you look at his character, he he had a, a, a fairly nice house, and it was him and his wife and his kids. Mm -hmm. It's There was no extra family. So he was obviously doing well enough and he's obviously his wife must have been working yet she was an old she was an ex-grifter as well that's obviously where they met so they obviously were surviving as it were yeah yeah you look at Johnny the impression you got from him he's he's sleeping in the cheap apartments where he could he could get because you see the bit where he's actually getting the done up, he gets the height haircut done and the manicure, and he keeps on going like that because he, what the hell's this? And it's a manicure, you know? just keep doing because mm. it looks weird. And then you see him getting suit, and he's going like that, as if to say, What do you mean getting it made to measure? <laughs> I, I normally go in and buy one, and yeah. it's fine. 
and then you see him into a, a room which is a nicer room in an apartment. So it's all that. It's you've got to yeah. you've got to look the part. You've got to, to look the part. And act it part. Yeah. So having a an a, a apartment that mm. is a decent apartment because all the other ones were. But even in there, he still put a bit in the door just in case he gets shot. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, so that was a nicer apartment than the, probably the ones that he'd had before if he was sleeping in an apartment, if not in an old factory and stuff like that. But then again, um, the movie can make you think of all those things. Can it be all that bad? And where he had to go to that cafe or uh, well, diner. Mm -hmm. What was it? Every night to eat his meals, isn't it? And have a cup of coffee? Yeah. Yeah. Interesting historical point. Um, I'm just uh, just finished up an H.G. Wells uh, book called uh, "When the Sleeper Awakes," mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and one of the things that the um, the Rumpelstiltskin character, the the sleeper, one of the things he recognizes about the the way history rolled out was that as the middle class grew, more people were eating at home on a regular basis and that they didn't do that back in the late 1800s. So I'm wondering, you know, it, this notion of everybody eating in the house and uh, that that was a new thing, that that wasn't the way it used to happen. Like there would be one local cook or one local restaurant or one yeah, local cafe yep. and well, everybody would we, eat there. Yeah. You think about it, especially during the, the depression, People were like, say you would have a house, uh, like we've got. Say for instance, the house you've got a house with two bedrooms, a bathroom, a living room, and a dining room and a kitchen. And the, if you had that house in the depression, you were rich. Yeah. Whereas if you had that house in the depression, those two bedrooms would be family staying in each of the two bedrooms. The living room would probably be split up. Depends how big it is, but that could be a room for another family. Then you'd have the dining room where the dining table for everybody to sit in if they did, or that would be another family. And would you have a kitchen? Probably not. So you might have a wee box in the corner with the fridge in. So instead of having to cook for all these people, you just went down to a diner where it was cheap mm -hmm. and right. ate there because you didn't need to supply the fuel for the cooker and all that, the electricity or the gas, whatever it was you were using, you, it, was, it was cheaper to eat out because you didn't need to buy food in and then store it and keep it fresh. You just went right. down somewhere, they bought in every day and it's fresh and you it was no problems. Mm. Yeah, and uh, they didn't oh, yeah, have uh, silicone have seals or anything yeah. like that. So any sort of insects getting into the house, I mean, a problem storage was probably a huge problem. You think about rats and mice and roaches yeah. and everything else. Yeah. And so think about it. People eating in diners. Yeah. yeah. And think about the entertainment. Most of them went out or how could I put this? Uh, play, what was it? Looper was playing dominoes. Mm -hmm. And they were, playing they, were the they were playing yeah. cribbage as well. Because remember, you see the bit when they're counting and he just throws the cards down because he's just been pulled in by the cops and he was trying not to give it away. Apparently. <laughs> he was pulled in by the feds. He was trying not to give it away because he's ratted on him and they're sitting playing cards and he throws the cards in because we're playing cribbage. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, those places used to be old hangouts too. Mm -hmm. You know there Especially, you go. When I lived yeah. in uh, Melbourne, when I lived in Thailand, people, uh, most people ate out. Very poor people by Western standards everywhere. There was little. There were little eateries and street vendors everywhere. Most folks don't cook at home. Mm -hmm. It's just. It's. I suppose it's that aspect of it. It's a similar idea when you go back to the depression. When somebody says they're poor now, they mm -hmm. live better than a rich person in the uh, during the depression because they've got TVs. They've got cookers, they've got fridges, they've got electronic equipment, phones, mm -hmm. laptops, whatever, even though they're poor. Whereas then if you're poor, you were living in the street. Here you're poor, you've still got a house, you've got a yeah. place over your head. 
it's as you said um, electric and gas going really am i and um, my dad was self-employed and a hell of a lot better educated and he had a better job than i did he kept when we were growing up obviously he would still dad i'm a bit skint here you go and sing me whereas now i i earn more than my dad did but he was better off than me <laughs> it's because money's not as valuable nowadays mm. Yeah, I mean, 20 cigarettes, uh, Alec will be able to tell you, is what, £11 for 20 now? 10, Roughly 15, about that. Right. Aye, so about £10, £11. Mm. Way back when I was younger, they were, they were what, 50p <laughs> for 20 A bit mm -hmm. different. And that's not to do with just the tax, that's the inflation as well. So if you take the inflation back 40 years... Food was, was a little bit cheaper in a way. Like, like, uh -huh. yeah. but that's what i'm saying so even then so even someone who's well off because you look at the money they stole at the beginning was it eleven thousand dollars and uh -huh. they thought they were millionaires five thousand i think it was no that was no no it was uh oh, remember, no, the guy thought he made five the, grand the yeah. guy thought he got five thousand but they nicked mm. from him the money taken and that guy says he thinks it's about eleven thousand yeah Right? right, so he's got eleven thousand, and they says they looked at it and says we're millionaires. Yeah, you look in those old Sears and Roebuck catalogs, you could buy an entire house for eleven thousand dollars, like yeah. from a uh, built, finished. Oh, from you, a kit. you 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 look at the stripper. Remember, he says you want to go out. I can't. I've got a shift on, and I need that five dollars for a night's work. In yeah, an yes. establishment like that, you would expect it to be a bit more than yeah. No, she was would... talking about a C note at least a hundred dollars. She was talking uh -huh. about mm. yeah, but that was five dollars, and she, he says I'll spend fifty on you. Yeah, you know I mean, and then but he goes into then he put three thousand on a bet. Yeah, and based on the fact that somebody would a, a shift for five dollars, and he would throw three thousand away in a bet. <laughs> what a twat! Uh -huh. Yeah. That was uh, retarded, especially yeah. especially with those like backstreet gambling houses where you had to go to the metal door or wooden door and knock on it, and the little slot opens up. Yeah, well, the spars went. Yeah, all right, come in. <laughs> uh, it was the fact as he put his hand on that he went click. Yeah, and he goes, "Oh, I'm glad that uh, you didn't win that because some of us would have actually been really disappointed if you had lost, if we had lost." Don't worry about it. Thank you very much because I would have got my ass kicked if you win, even though it's not my fault. Yeah, you know I mean, we can't take that yeah. back to bet. And if you win, I still got to do it, even though you told me to let him bet it. And it's it's random if he hadn't clicked the button. Yeah, you know I mean, it's hmm. how, how could the guy actually be so terrified of actually something he had no control over? I just want to bring up something uh, to Steve. Um, mm. What are the gambling laws like over in the States? Because over here we've got like betting shops galore. Well, it I used to be a, a big deal. Um, but nowadays yeah. it's kind of gotten pretty vague and ambiguous. Um, with all the, uh, the Indian gambling casinos and Las Vegas right around the corner, the whole thing has gotten really, really vague as to what's okay and what's not. I mean, the, we now Steven. have television shows where they cover um, card games, right? Yeah. They got cable channels yeah. and, yeah. and uh, YouTube channels that cover card right. games. Stephen, what I, um, I think Alex talking about is, I suppose, we know Vegas, the state of Vegas, uh, the yeah. uh, and state you've got vegas you've got reno and stuff like that they're cities that basically you can it's they've got a big gambling license and then you've got the indian casinos but casinos there is a few casinos over here but same very specific license but mm. on a lot of high streets here there is a betting office where you can go in and bet on horses on uh, greyhounds on football matches it's that well, kind of, I suppose. Can you go in? As a doubt, if you could walk down the street and see a bookie, you can go in and actually place a bet. Yeah. We obviously I think it's all, all online ones, like the now. Uh -huh. But they, uh -huh. they, I remember uh, OTB in the in the states during the during the seventies and eighties. There was a place called OTB, and it was all, uh, on track betting. 
or uh-huh. off track betting. And it was basically just a, a place you'd go into about the size of a small McDonald's and they would have all the games sh- uh, showing on television monitors and yeah. you'd go up to a glass front window, like in a, in a, so in, like, like, a, like a federal exchange or something yeah. and you would place your bets. But yeah. now every single gas station in, in the country, um, sells dozens of lotto tickets and that's yeah. gambling yeah but uh, that's the, the, those what you're describing you described the other small that's a bookies we've i've grown up with bookies i can go into a bookie since i was 16 so you're talking about that was 40 years ago and they weren't even new then so right. we could go down this around the corner to the bookies and go and place our bet my dad used to do it very rarely, but he would go down maybe when the Grand National was on. So I was like ten year old. My dad would say, "Right, pick a horse. I'll put t- I'll put five pence on it for you." And we would all pick a horse. He would go down to the bookies, put it on. So you're talking about that's fifty years ago. My dad, uh, the bookies were opened in most street corners, William Hill, stuff like that. Oh. It was just that's these set of things that. Whereas when we were watching you, uh, the American programs. It was almost a case of you had runners and you basically they would be going back through the back door. Mm-hmm. I want you to place a bit. All right, okay, phone up. And they would take the money, but it would, and then there would be the cops, the bunco squad, trying to get in and get them and stuff like that. But mm. so we found that weird when we were watching it because we could go down to the bookies and bet a horse, bet a football match, bet mm. the great house. Easily every day, and there were plenty of bookies, and there's more now than there used to be. It's but what we would so when we were watching that, things like this thing would never have worked in the UK. <laughs> the, guy, the guy would have just gone to the bookies, <laughs> right? Yeah, I think they've gone to a, a, a back room bookies because they would not have existed, or they may have, but they may have done for gambling uh, the, this uh, maybe roulette and uh, poker and stuff like that because they were not licensed the same way well uh, we still have that sequence in uh goodwill hunting where you know uh, he takes her out on a date and they put a bet down on a horse on a, on a dog race but did pretty... they go in a dog track to do yeah that. they went to a dog track and they placed a bet they placed the That's bet on it. And from what I understand, dog. every single uh, racing arena like that that does horse and dog, Has they have a bet. betting a betting facility. So, yeah, but they've got a betting like facility said, for their, what's happening on that facility. So you correct. can go into a betting facility and bet on the football. Whereas no, we could go into, but like we I go said, into our bookings. We can go to our bookings and put anything on anything it's playing that day. Mm. I think it went directly from those little OTB offices to um, or uh, doing all of this online. Yeah, a lot of it's online, but we've got mm. we've got William Hill online, um, Betfred online. Uh, there is Bingo online. online. Yeah, you know, Bingo online. Yeah, but now we've got those are actually we've still got yeah. the corner so I could go into mm. not. Um, in my village, there's none, but you got to Kamarnock, there's about seven or eight up the main street easily. Mm. So that's what I'm saying. It's just, but when we were watching this thing, we were sitting there thinking, didn't happen in the UK because all the guy would do is go and give me a bit, he would just go to the nearest bookies. <laughs> they might not take a million, but I would just say to one guy, right, go and put 10 grand on there, 10 grand on there, and just all yeah. they do is walk up. There's a bit. And if they, if they go into a big city, there could be about 15, 20 bookies, and you could put a big bet on it as long as they know the horse. Whereas here, they couldn't do that. Yes, they would, if they were wanting to put in the big bets like that, there's very, there was very few that would actually take certain bets because they were actually in Main Street ones, so they didn't have that type of cash. But things like the Sting couldn't have worked here because if somebody goes in, they, they don't need to go into a particular back street bookies to do it, so they're not going into deliberately bankrupt them. They're just going into a shop and putting a bet on. And if they win, well, they win. I, during the 20s and 30s, the United States went through a huge moralist movement, and yes, then but, right uh, after the world after World War II, we went through it again in the 50s, and um, that's where a lot of the the criminal or 
I think the the mafia, uh, the mafia I, and yeah. the FBI were learning lessons from each other every five seconds because yeah, that was, that was they all the, gave up the, during the sixties and seventies. It became yeah, the like, prohibition was what launched the mob, the mafia. Yeah, pretty it, much. They basically allowed them to actually consolidate because they could make so much money. Yeah, and it was and it wasn't regulated. That's uh-huh. the whole big yeah. thing. It the government's regulating all of these things, which is where those o- OTB places came from, was for state license. You know, they were finally able to legally gamble, which is where the facility of Las Vegas really got its thing, and it became a mm-hmm. sexy thing during the '60s because it was freedom. It was considered freedom and liberty to be able to gamble. So yeah. I, you know, it's it's weird in the United States. There's a whole barrier of moralism that they had yeah. to contend with that I don't think existed in Europe because they had already gone through that about 150 years ago. Yeah. It was just it's just funny when we, I was watching it obviously in my late teens watching it thinking that would never harm here. <laughs> because <laughs> we could go down I could at, at 17 I could walk down to the bookies and put a, a, a as long as I was over 16, I could bet. So I could go mm. down, buy a packet of fags and go next door into the bookies, have a fag while I'm putting my line on and just hand it over and my money. Yeah. Well, that's why that that's why that line in uh, in uh, 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 Pulp Fiction is so hysterical where, you know, uh, John, John Travolta's character comes back from Amsterdam. And he's like, uh-huh. you can carry it. You could walk around smoking it. The cops can't search you, right? And it's like that was a big, sexy thing in the in the early '90s, in the mid '90s, because it was marijuana wasn't legal around here. <laughs> do you do you want to know the funny thing that I was told? This must have, it was about three, four years ago. My nephew went over, and he was telling us he sat down and he didn't smoke it, so he took a cigarette out. So, Two of my other nephews were sitting smoking it and they asked him to leave because he was smoking cigarettes. So they could sit and smoke a spliff, but he couldn't smoke a cigarette unless he was he had to go outside the shop to smoke it because it was bad for you. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they put him up sitting there going, Yeah. And he's going, Excuse me, could you leave? You're not allowed to smoke that in here. <laughs> And I thought mm. that's hilarious. You're not allowed to smoke that in here, and that's the one that's not got the drugs. <laughs> if it's got drugs, you can smoke it. If it's not got drugs, out. <laughs> mm. I just want to go off topic. Off topic here. You mean uh, like we do? <laughs> yeah, I know, but I'm talking about like the film The Untouchables with the prohibition. Mm-hmm. Because you couldn't have alcohol whatsoever. And how far did that stretch into the 1930s? There's, um, uh, what do you mean into the 1930s? Tennessee, who make Jack Daniels, that is still yeah. a dry state. Some mm. states never repealed it. Right. And yet... <laughs> and yet... Mm-hmm. And yet, everybody still has it. It's it's, it's kind of bizarre. Yeah. yeah. But it was, um, it was right, after the de- right after the Depression was uh, bottled up a little bit. Um, it was repealed almost immediately because... Um, the government couldn't afford the policing it would take to enforce the prohibition. So they were just like, that's it. We're done. We're not doing it. Everybody's allowed to have a drink. The criminal mm. organizations are out of control with this stuff. There's far too much killing in the street. It's done. We're all, it's done. It's over. We're finished. No more prohibition. Yeah. After they built the house, they decided to actually stop painting it. Basically, after they actually gave the, the, ga- uh, the, the, the gangs the power, and the money, then they turn around and says, right, we're stopping it. They'll say, says, right, we've got all this power and money. What will we do with it now? <laughs> you see yeah. what I mean? If they it, hadn't organised. Because it's not every day you go into, what well, see, seeing it in your film, is that you go in to the place to make a bet and they got a bar there. And right. we don't really have them over here in betting shops. Yeah. But that was because it was uh, illegal gambling because it was always the back room gambling so when people went into the back room to gamble mm. they, may, they would drink as well because it's not as if they, anything was regulated all the bookies over here were regulated they weren't pubs they didn't have mm. a liquor license so right 
the same yeah. as you go into a pub and it didn't have it had a puggy on the uh, in it, but they wouldn't have horse racing and stuff like that. And for all those who wonder, a puggy is a slot machine. Okay, That's what we call a slot machine a puggy. So I, I know yeah. a lot of people in the states were going, "What the fuck's a puggy?" <laughs> <laughs> Also, Alec, uh, there's, there was a lot of um, a lot of these establishments. Once they get you in, they don't want you leaving, and they certainly That's don't true. want you bringing in your own booze. Yeah. So, the more things they could sell you so, while yeah. you were in their establishment, uh, the more control they had over the finances. Yeah, I was talking to a friend, and we were talking about smoking, um, and I says. When I used to go to Vegas, it was great. I could sit with a beer, a cigarette, and gamble. Mm -hmm. and she says, they still, they still really let you smoke indoors, I thought. In America, you're not allowed to smoke indoors. I says, casinos still allow it. And she yeah. says, why is that? I says, because they don't want you going outside to have a cigarette and then realising, oh, it's dark, I better go home. That's so you can right. sit there and smoke. That's why there's no windows yeah, in the casinos because they clocks. don't want you uh, or clocks. They don't want you to know it's dark outside. And I right, say yeah. that's why they use chips instead of money because if you've got chips, you've already spent the money. You've just got these bits of plastic. Especially, especially when you have got those people sitting at what you call puggies in like all these films set in Las Vegas, where they're just sitting there pulling, you know. Done that as well. Just get ten dollars worth of uh, dimes and just sit there, yeah. big buck, and go. Home. I have done that. I have done that. <laughs> because yeah. these days, when I want to play, it's a bet on the Grand National, and I go to my local bookmakers. It's you go in there, and they're all on the slot machines, mm -hmm. and it, and you think, guys, will you ever leave? I've I've known someone who spent three hundred pound. And uh, well, he was watching two horses running. He spent three hundred pounds in a slot machine. Easily, it's easily done if you just don't. If it's just choo, choo, you mm. don't notice it. Yep, I and remember. I, uh, I remember seeing an article uh, back in the turn of the century, uh, turn of last century, and it was talking about the gambling industries in Japan, and they were talking about some of the earliest forms of online betting. At their at their particular racetracks, Japan's got a whole other gambling industry over there. They they do horses, they do ponies, but they also do pachinko as well, yes, which is their I slot machine. That. Yeah, so it's it, it's it's rampant all over the place. I can't even imagine the cultural cues and tropes involved in some of the. And there must be a whole thing in China. And that we don't even know about, that we aren't even, it isn't even part of our conversation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I, no, I, I, it was just something I always found funny because when I was watching it, I was thinking, I always used to think it, it wasn't just this movie. Anytime I saw the old movies and you see them in there, the guy would come in and say, Can I put a horse on? And he would go, Hold on. So and so was wanting to put a horse on. Right, okay. And, uh, uh, put a horse on for him. They would say, mm. He would take the money. So they had. Uh, Aligned to somebody else that was doing all the betting, and mm -hmm. he was just holding the money. So there was, the, if the cops came in, he's just sitting there with money and a phone. That's mm -hmm. right. Yeah, you know I mean, and they've and, been I, in there and they've just got a load of hangy, but no money. So if they they need them, yeah, there's no link to the money, and if they need the money, there's no link to the. So basically, it's nothing can get done with the money at all. Especially when you got the guys who knew which horses were going to win. Like, here's a tip for you, here's a tip for you, you know. I've had a lot of them, but 90% of them didn't win. I know. <laughs> I know. It's... I've got a system. Like, see, if you look for this and get that and do that, yeah, you probably still lose all your money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, and those um, those backroom gambling houses were a risk wins. to go into uh, just to walk in the front in the front door. Uh, you think you're, you're basically walking into a den of thieves. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. So there's no guarantee that even if you do win, that you're going to get out of there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Well, so you look at the old, mob, the old mob run casinos. You saw the movies about them. If yep. somebody won too much, they might get out to their car, but they might not make it to their car. Right. Because yeah. they wanted their money back. So they would just send somebody out to the car park and beat you up and steal the money. That's right. 
That's right. Mm -hmm. They got inside information and probably control of the city as well. Yeah. Oh, yes. So, but you uh, remember uh, Minder? Anybody remember? Uh, yeah, I remember it very well. Right, Minder was about this wheeling dealer, and he had this bodyguard who was his Minder. And he was always on a bit of trying to make money. And there was one episode where he went up and he had there was two phone booths out. Um, oh, yeah, boat. I remember that. And, he's, and he says, and, and one of the guys meant to help him. They said, I, I'm your minder. I'm not answering the phone. <laughs> and this girl comes along. He says, I'll pay you a tenner if you just answer the phone. And, and she says, what's it for? <laughs> she says, oh, if somebody phones up, just, tell, just give them three horses from this list. She says, what for? He says, just give her three horses because we're we're um we're we're the inside track. Mm -hmm. She says, but what if they don't win? She says they'll no phone back, but if they do win, they'll phone back and give his money. So basically he was just people were phoning up, he was telling them six uh this this race, well this horse is gonna win. And if it win, they would phone up and, and send them money. <laughs> If it didn't win, they wouldn't phone back. It was just one of those things. But he had the girl just giving numbers out at random from the horses, and he was giving numbers out at random. And it was literally that was their money making scheme, just mm. giving tips that made they were just making up. And if there was six horses running, then they had one six, one chance in six of getting it right and receiving money from the winners. <sighs> and it was that's how crazy things like. It was like a movie, yeah. Greyhound Racing and all. He did his Greyhound Racing, but that was the one that I remember. But the simple yeah. fact is when it comes to, to people giving you tips, yep, Arthur Daly's your man. That's exactly how it works. I'll give you a tip. Horse number one and race number one. I'll give you a tip. Horse number two and race number one. They'll just do that until they basically, and if they get it right once, if there's 10 horses running, they've got a 10% chance of getting it right. Right, right, right. Yeah, and, I mean, and that that's what a lot of these uh, people don't may, may not realize it. They're realizing it now with all these GoFundMe little things and every and Indiegogo uh, things and st Kickstarter mm -hmm. things that are going on nowadays. But mm -hmm. that that's, that's a rule of thumb. If you want to do some sort of hustle, the best way to do it is to, to keep throwing numbers at the wall and, it, you know, if people are sending you a dollar for each one of those things, then, you know, whatever. Who cares if they lose yeah. or if they win? They're basically sending you a dollar every single yeah. time. So who cares? Even if yeah. you get caught, uh, uh -huh. you know, it doesn't matter. Yeah, I've even said to my wife when she says, an email comes through, how do people fall for those scams? I says, they send out 10 million emails. Mm -hmm. If 1% of 1% reply to it. That's over 10,000 people replying. That's but right. If and you do that 10, those, 10 million I, times. Yeah. You know. And if 1% of them send you money, that's a 1,000 people sending you money. Mm -hmm. So if you can just keep doing that every so often. Game's out. <laughs> Game's probably out falling asleep. He's Everybody probably that. Uh -huh. Internet does. advertising is free. Right. Yes. So who cares how many emails you send out? It's an electronic message. It doesn't cost you anything. Exactly. Back in the day, you had to print mm. all that stuff. Yeah. But nowadays. Yeah. Yeah. They, I'm sure that there's some of that in Los Angeles, too. I mean, we have consolidated um, garbage companies here in Los yeah. Angeles, and most of them have uh, lockout contracts where nobody else can cover the city. So you can't tell me that there isn't corruption and all of that. I know. Uh, That's why they actually, a lot of politicians deal with unions because they know the unions, if they tell their, their members, then that's the whole city because everybody, a lot of people work in the unions. So if the unions actually agree, they try and get the unions behind them. And that's yeah. why the mob got into the unions in the 60s and 70s. Yeah. I mean, that's but, what, that's yeah, what I, uh, I work for. A, I work for a logistics company, so I can't see anything much about haulers actually in the mafia and stuff like that. I may get whacked, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not talking about stop talking about that on the TV. So I may get an actual, <laughs> but back to the movie, shall we? Yes, but the, the, the thing is, I, I that was one thing I always found about. I found weird about this movie is because being an outsider looking in, we're sitting mm -hmm. there thinking, 
how does that work? Because it, it could never work here. And it was that. But if you take horse racing out and put card, uh, poker in, then yes, that could have worked because poker at the time, you didn't have that. That was always up at someone's house or gambling dens out at the back. Right. So I could understand that. But it was the horse racing. It's only because in Britain, horse racing was always a big thing. Even for hundreds of years, horses have been a big thing. Horse betting on horses has been a big thing. It's just expanded to cover greyhounds, football, hockey, rugby, any sport. You can bet any on. sport. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and now they're betting on uh, all kinds of crazy things. Oh, I, I understand. There's numbers oh. on everything now. Oh no, they used to bet or every year on if there was going to be uh, snow in London, and there was one roof. If the snow landed on that roof, then that's what it counted. It didn't count if it landed a, a mile down the road. That didn't count. So if I wanted to say in Glasgow, I want I, I want to pay a hundred pounds, it's going to be snowing in Glasgow on Christmas Day. They'll say, Okay, but this is the part of Glasgow it'll cover. So they maybe George Square. So if George Square has got snow on it, um it is white on Christmas Day between twelve noon. Or twelve midnight, thing me, fine. You'll win your bet, and we'll give you odds of ten to one. So they, if you ask them for a bet, they'll. There's somebody's already bet that um, aliens are real and they'll, and they'll land. <laughs> they got thousands to one, but they put money yeah. on it, and they're still waiting for it to actually mature. <laughs> it's like there's this joke on the TV show um, Only Fools and Aussies uh, by the Driscoll Brothers. Or about the Driscoll brothers, where one of them placed what well, I, I don't know how much it was, but that the world was going to end, <laughs> and they're still waiting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Roman, uh, what is the what is the Vorgan Shadow Alliance? Uh, what is that? <laughs> the Vorgan Shadow Alliance. That's the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Gal Galaxy. The Vorgans. <laughs> the Vorgans. <laughs> That's what I'm thinking of Vorgons, but Vorgon, I don't know if he's actually, but. You know, that would be an a absolutely fantastic peripheral spin off movie, would be the Vorgon Shadow Alliance betting on whether or not Arnold Schwarzenegger is going to win against the Predator. You know, they're, they're just sitting in orbit, right, around the Earth. And the Predator went down there as their contestant, and they're like, yeah, I bet you could totally kick their ass. And the other guy's like, "I'll take, I'll take uh, the opposite of that uh, for for you know five thousand two locks and uh, mm. you know and yeah. blah 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 blah." Do you know what the Vogon? Do you know what the Vogons torture? Uh, uh, how can I? The Vogons like to torture people to death with poetry. Did you know that? Yes, they did. <laughs> Yes, yeah, I think to the galaxy. Everybody knows that after I've watched yeah. Hitchhikers. Oh, but... And actually, Vorgon Shadow Alliance isn't Hitchhikers because no. they're the Vogon Destructor fleet, and it's yes. the, and it's not the Shadow Alliance. So it's not Star Trek related, is it? So I don't know where Vorgon is. So I think mm. um, back to Stephen's yeah. actually original questions. Yeah. <laughs> Roman, what's the Vorgon Shadow Alliance? <laughs> <laughs> You know, I'd love to have a poetry read-off between the Vorgon uh, construction uh, fleet and the Ents from Lord of the Rings. Just a poetry read-off uh, between the two of them. <laughs> with with uh, judges of anybody with blue hair. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> and anyone survives can be president. But um, I gotta no, say, I was watching. The, did, uh, you see the, did you see the most <laughs> the recent joke on uh, the recent meme on Twitter? About? Superman, um, Snow White, and Pinocchio were walking down the street, and they saw a big sign: um, beauty, beauty, a beauty contest. Snow White goes in, comes out with a crown with a big smile on her face. Yes. Walk further down, world's strongest man contest. Superman goes in, comes out with a bet with a big smile on his face. Walk down further, and there's a best liar in the world contest. Pinocchio come because then comes out crying, going, "Who the fuck's Joe Biden?" I saw it in Twilight, and I couldn't kind of stop that. And I thought, "Come yeah, on, that man, one, that, that good that one. I like that one." <laughs> yeah. But it could actually that could be any politician. As I said, yeah. I was saying, like me, 
at one point you used to go in and root for a politician you liked. You would vote for the politician you liked or trusted most. Now mm -hmm. people go in and vote for the one they hate the least because all politicians are the same. So we go in and vote for the one we hate the least or we go in with an agenda as in, I want them out, so I'll vote for anyone, even though I hate them just as much, to get them out. And that's what I think is crazy. Politician, politics is down to the fact that you're voting for people you dislike because there's other people you dislike more rather than voting for somebody you like and trust. That means politics has failed. Yeah. yeah. But that takes us all back to criminals and the thing. Yep. Uh -huh. I was just watching a review uh, earlier today, and it's astonishing how um, Robert Redford and Paul Newman are still seen as the charming young men that they were back in the day. I mean, this this young lady just couldn't help herself. Every five seconds, she was like, these boys are really cute. <laughs> she kept on saying it over and over again. It was hysterical. And she kept on trying to uh, figure out, she's like, I could swear it. Robert Redford looked so much like Brad Pitt when he was younger, and it they kept going on and on and on about it. It's and it's true. I mean, these guys were the the. Oh God, they they were the the symbols. They were the sex symbols. Uh huh. Of yeah, the age. Yeah. Uh huh. But yeah, again, you look at it. John Wayne, he was a sex symbol of his age. You go back, um, Lon Chaney, but Boris Karloff, sex symbol yeah. of his time. And even further back than that, you've got what would you call him, Douglas Fairbanks Jr. Yeah, yeah. You know I mean, that, yeah, and I would say um, Basil Rathbone as well. Yeah, I mean, these guys were were heavy hitters back in the yeah. day. They had those charming People photographs. Just watching them. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. And I wonder uh, how much of this film was designed specifically to be that, right? Because when when I look at these films, I always try to imagine what was a date night like when this film was released, right? And I could see a guy easily talking his girl into seeing this movie, or vice versa, the girl easily talking her guy into going to see this movie. Yeah, because he's like, oh, it's all about a grift. It's all about some cool dudes. You know, there's going to be some gangster stuff. This should be a lot of fun. Right, as opposed to it being a romantic comedy where the guy's like, "Nah, let's go see the cowboy flick or let's go see the monster movie." Yeah, I, uh, you can imagine the two of them going, "I'll pick the movie." No, I'll pick the movie. No, I'll pick. Okay, you pick the movie. This thing. How are we going to pick that? <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Because it, it, you know, it was just rough enough, and yet it was still cartoonish enough. Yeah, it was. Mm. It was rough enough, and it had enough crime aspects in it to drag in the guys mm -hmm. it had Robert Redford <laughs> as Paul Newman to drag in the women yep exactly exactly wow. and I'm I'm also I'm kind of startled there isn't a single uh and this is no offense to the young ladies uh Aline uh Brannon and uh Demetra uh, these were not Drop dead gorgeous, you yeah. know, double digit tens. Well, Aline across. Branning, you think about it, she was. They in, were very simple, natural looking women. Ah, uh, because yeah. she was the sergeant in. Um, oh, God. The white film with Dalby Young. Yeah. Private Benjamin. Yeah. So she was, she was the sergeant in that. And then the one that played Lolita. I must admit, I was the. I thought. When <laughs> Paul James got it going, what did she see in her? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, because you can imagine a boyfriend, a girlfriend sitting there, and she turns to him and say, I wish you were like him. And he's turning around and saying, You're thinking like her. <laughs> but that's just me. But yeah, so I, I'm just, I would just get slapped. I'm the type of person to get slapped. I, I mean, I could see, I could see some young ladies being just like, I'm so much prettier than they are, and I could uh -huh. easily nab Paul and and Robert. Yeah, because I'm prettier than both of those ladies, and I I would bet that there was some casting choices in that. Um, that that was a reality. I None think of the, all the I women think... were just regular kind of gals. They weren't uh -huh. really starlet looking gals. 
I think they were just picked for their acting abilities, not their looks, because it's the way they were portraying those characters. That's but the, the, way, the way all the film industry looks always triumph. And it, we're not it's yeah. not saying that they're actually not pretty, but they're not superstar pretty. Right, that's what I'm saying. That they're not cover model pretty, yeah, like no. they would be they, today. They are great character actresses, but they have got a unique look, shall we say? Mm -hmm. And the reality is, you look at those old photographs, and a lot of these dancers were not very pretty women in the face. Pretty. Mm -hmm. Um, they were all in really great shape and they were all very talented and probably all really, really charming as well, but hmm. they were not gonna, classic beauties. Just like me, up. just like me. They weren't classic beauties, just like me, according to Aero. Yeah. Just bring out the photo of Elaine Brennan. This is from 1963. I'll find it on Wikipedia. She is good looking for that photo. Mm -hmm. Do you know why she changed? Because that was just before I was born. So after I was born, she knew she'd lost me. <laughs> <laughs> but all I can say is that he's just, he's just oh, acting but, a bit. But it's, it's acting ability. And um, I know we sound uh, terrible, but you look mm. at some of the people who were classed as good character actors, but weren't um, pretty. You look at Angela Lansbury, but you look at her in her heyday. Yeah. Yeah, and that's the difference. Is as women mature, people see them as less pretty. However, their their acting ability increases, and I think it's because they realise that they have got the jobs based on their talent rather than just their looks. Yeah. So they're sitting. They, they don't need to actually think, well, that character I'm playing is, is there's no makeup on her or our makeup's to make her look this way or that way. They, they go, that's fine because I just want to act that part. You look at some women and some men, Christ almighty, you look at some men, the their character is suddenly de-aged because they don't want to actually play an older character. Guys will do that as well, just as much as women. You'll see a character, and I mean, if you've read the book, the book, wait a minute, this guy's meant to be about in his 70s. He's only in his 50s there. It's because the actor's 50 doesn't want to put makeup on and make look older because he mm -hmm. doesn't like that idea. And the same for female actors, they don't, some of them don't like the idea. And that's the ones that are pretty. Whereas the ones who are actors can act. So they don't think that, well, they're actually making me look uglier. Um, that's not a bad thing, or make me look ordinary is not a bad thing because it's not going to hinder, could help my acting. And that's the difference. I think the two, the, well, the two females, but anyone in this, males and females, the, the only one, do you know the only person that felt off as an actor and he was meant to be off as an actor? Was the member the guy at the beginning with the knife? Yeah. And then he gets his nose burst as well. Yeah. But he mm -hmm. wants to join in because he was friends with Luther. He just wants to be part of it. And he, he'd never done a big call and he'd never done that. So you can see he's got that nerves about him. He doesn't know like when he's sitting there, when he's meant to be in, he's looking up and someone's going, go, go. And he goes up, go on, horse, and you're dead. Here we go. You should have had your money. He was sort of overacting it. But he deliberately, de it was a deliberate overacting mm -hmm. because when he's not meant to be acting and he's doing a scene with the rest of the characters, his acting's perfect, but he's meant to overact. And it worked because it was overacted. And to me, that shows a good actor that can actually overact when he needs to. Here's a trivia for you. Did you know Jack Nicholson was offered for the lead role, but he turned it down? <laughs> Jack what Nicholson? for this? Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> what, what lead role would they have got? It, it, doesn't, have got... it doesn't really say. Because would they have classed the lead, lead role as Robert Shaw if Jack Nicholson got the Robert Shaw part? It could maybe. have been Paul Newman's. Oh, I can't see that because I thought they, they built this because um, Paul Newman and Robert Redford had 
uh, worked well together. Yeah, well, it was the same director. I guarantee yeah. that that Jack Nicholson thing was a was a shot in the pan um, because mm. he wanted he must have wanted Redford and Newman for this. You know, the director must have. You know, after doing Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, it must have been a no brainer for him. He's like, no, these are the guys. I want these guys. Yeah. Uh, Melvin, are you surprised the Oscars sort of did that for certain people? I don't know. Certain people got, uh, go Oscars and certain people didn't. Does not matter if they're good or not? Mm. The Oscars is a bought and sold thing. People know beforehand that they're going to get, they're going to win. Yeah. Yeah, you know I mean, it's it's been political since it starts. Nobody's hidden the fact that they just don't talk about it. Yeah. Because there's been people who have they've told they've mentioned knew they weren't getting it because their politics didn't line up with the the academies. So they yeah. knew automatically out. So they didn't they didn't even actually pretend that they were going to be nominated because of that aspect of it. So people know who's getting it before. Yeah, I mean, because you can guarantee the people that are coming up going, I don't know what you say, but I'd like to think, ah, yeah, I've already rehearsed it for the last four weeks. How long is this speech going on for? <laughs> uh, exactly. I've, re- I've only rehearsed this for the last four weeks, but I don't know what to say. And it's stuff like that. But everybody is aware before they go in that the ceremonies especially within that it's who can actually do the most for you is getting it so if you want an actress who to star in one of your movies and you sort of hint well if you get the oscar would you star mm. yeah i mean and they oh surprise surprise they got the oscar oh look we're starting a new movie it's yeah, Tropic like Thunder kind of teases this idea, right? Yes, he, yeah. It, the, uh, the, the guys in Cambodia talking to him, and, and he's like, oh, you should have won an Oscar. And he's like, well, you know, we, we didn't want to spend that much money and blah, blah, blah. You know, and it's like he basically reveals the whole scam right there. And I, yeah. I know that they've done it before. I know I've, I've seen the whole hmm. thing laid out before. But, yeah, it's, it's not just a popularity contest. It's quite it's literally – you know, best in show kind of nonsense. Yeah, it's the same yeah. idea. You look at all these, um, the Olympics. Yes, we don't know where we're going to do it in the next four years. We're just going to go around a few places to have a look. So yeah. <laughs> how much is in this bag? How much is in this one? No, this one's got <laughs> um, Oh, this one's only got chocolate, so they're out. Oh, this <laughs> one's got a car. Um, they're, in the, they're in the running. This one, and it's that. They basically, can't, you see them, they're going... They go in and accordingly they get things like fur coats, uh, new cars and stuff like that. And then they wonder and why. Then, uh, then they, they go, oh, they got it. Isn't mm. that a surprise, boys and girls? Mm-hmm. Ah, you're right. It's like with the Foot World Cup at the moment. <laughs> yeah. Well, the World Cup, you're not allowed to talk about. But no, 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 no. But it doesn't go against the narrative at all. Yeah. All I can yeah. say, they are very big cons. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm going to bring up this. Uh, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen it. There's a TV show that you, used to be broadcast in the UK called The Hustle. Yes, I didn't okay. like it, but I did. I did no, uh, but I this does owe a lot, a lot to this film. Uh, it does. Uh, it see, is. Do you know? I see the hustle. Mm. I had heard a rumor that they had actually wanted to call it this thing and they were node, it was node, so the hustle was the next thing. And I I heard it was a rumour at the time. I don't know if it was true or it was just because they were trying to link it. So Mm -hmm. if you start a rumour saying that that's what they wanted to call it, then even if it was untrue, it links it to this thing. And I think it was... Want they wanted to link it to this thing just the for thing, the simple fact as it was all about the con. The thing is, is that the hustle was set more in modern times. I would have preferred it was set back during the Great Depression era. That would uh, be see more. the thing is that yeah, 
set it in the modern times. They don't need to worry about costumes, cars, whatever. Yeah, set it right. back that far, then the cost goes up because anytime they want to shoot outdoors, there's a they have to dress all the setup. Right. Whereas if you 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 want to shoot outdoors, you just get a street and you can just get a bit where nobody's coming past. Makes it easier. So that's yeah. why they would have gone back the way. But yes, the hustle. The characters in the hustle are just criminals, whereas yeah. in the thing, they were lovable rogues, shall we say? Yes. Uh, yeah, Paul Newman got gypped. You just think about Cool Hand Luke, and you're just like, this guy never won an Oscar. You got to yeah. be frigging kidding! What what did what Oscar did he get again? Uh I got. I think it was for the Color of Money. Oh yeah, that's a good film. And, yeah. and it was poignant because that film is a sequel to a movie where he was playing the Tom Cruise character. The Hustler. Yeah. Yeah. So it was ironic that they Did chose that the film. Or is that the Tussle? One of the two songs. <laughs> I'm no good with music. Leave me alone. <laughs> Speaking of which... The, the Entertainer, I remember that I being on every out. top 40 all through my childhood. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You mean this? Um, let's see. I know I, I'd actually set this up and I was going to do it, but let's just do... That's about all anybody should feel safe doing on YouTube. Yeah. I, I had put it up just to make sure that I got a copyright claim and but the owner allows you to use this. Yeah. So. I just like that bit. Was it the trailer or the opening? That's the opening. The opening is where you had them there, right? You know, the picture, and then it turns the page and it zooms out to the director with do, yeah, well, know. they basically yeah. as it that but it did the uh, Paul Newman. Mm -hmm. uh, I was about to say. <laughs> I don't know why. Again. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> one's a brunette. One's a blonde. One has a mustache. <laughs> one doesn't. Exactly. I don't know why he just keeps on going. Boop. One this never laid me. down on a lion skin rug. Never yes. in front of a fireplace. <laughs> <laughs> Although many women, I'm sure, would have loved Robert Redford lying out old Deadpool style. Yes. But, uh, uh -huh. Yeah. But I don't know why it was. But anyway, they do the Robert Redford, Paul Newman, and then it's all the other cast members, which I thought was a good way because it basically it introduces you to the way it was going to be done. Turn the page, the cast. Turn the page, the setup. Turn the page. And it was almost like you're watching a book. And that's what it was meant to be done. And I think it actually set up quite well with that. So I liked that start. The music was just iconic. Just dragged you in. And then the way it did it, the cast, the setup and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I liked that aspect of it. And someone who's not a big fan of, I, I don't normally bother about music, but music has to be... I suppose iconic, like the Star Wars theme, Doctor Who theme, the uh, tab, uh, the Star Trek theme, the, um, the two thousand one space Odyssey, the do 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 and all that. But the Entertainer is just one of those. You hear that, you know the movie, and if you can actually tie a piece of music into a movie, even way back then was just perfect because to me how many movies prior to 1970 say can you tie the music with the the film do you know what i mean 
how many movies out there had such an iconic piece of music to introduce it that you could link it to it? I'm thinking yeah. just off the top of my head, The Exorcist is an obvious one. Uh, but... Two Blair Bells. Uh, mm -hmm. That's what I'm saying. When was that? 70... That was around 73 or 4? 70, that's what I'm saying, but prior to 70. I think in the 70s, that's when the music seemed to tag the film. Yeah, so they that is true. Them. It was once prior to that. You think about the old, uh, even well-known ones like Casa, uh, Casablanca, um, It's a Wonderful Life. Right, fair enough, musicals, that's different because they're designed around the music. So like Calamity Jane and um, White Christmas. Yes, right. that's different because right. they are musicals. I'm talking about ones that, like, for instance, um, It's a Wonderful Life. Can you tie the music to that? Or if you heard the music, would you tie it to the film? No, Same as no. things like you would even horrors like Frankenstein or... Yeah, I mean, you would hear the creepy music, but would you be able to say, well, that's the mummy or that's the wolfman or that type of thing? You wouldn't. But I think in the 70s is when they tied, they started yeah. get, getting composers that not only wrote good music, because you're not saying anything prior to that, the music was bad in the movies, but you were saying as then they were... It wasn't prioritised the same way, and it wasn't marketed the same way yeah. either. So um, they had discovered they something during the 60s. Yeah. The music uh -huh. industry became directly attached as a member yeah. of the entertainment industry. And TV shows, you can do that prior to the six, the seventies, Star Trek, Doctor Who, the right. um, things like that. But they were TV shows. You heard them every every week or whatever. So those stuck with you. But for movies, there was very few that movies where people actually got a movie soundtrack, not even a soundtrack and a a specific piece of movie that was linked to that and that's the thing and I think the 70s is when that all started and the entertainer I think is one of the best yes you've got the Star Wars, you've got the Exorcist, Tubular Bell but I think the entertainer is entertaining apart from anything else it's just such a lively tune that you, you know when you're listening to that what the movie's going to be. It's not going to be Tubular Bell did it the same way. The Tubular Bell soon you knew that was going to be a creepy fucking film. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? The Exorcist because of the way Tubular Bells brought you in on it. But the entertainer, you knew this is going to be an entertaining movie. This is going to be a fun movie to watch. And it's that type of thing. I think that's when they started tying it up in the early 70s and then you see how it went through. But yeah, that's just you know, me, there's also um, there's also a part of this too that I hadn't thought of until we started talking around this idea that uh, Charlie Chaplin was given his uh, honorary Academy Award around the same time that this picture came out, mm -hmm. and I think that Hollywood was going through this kind of legacy revival where they were bringing up the older films. They were finally starting to celebrate themselves. Mm -hmm. As an entity, Hollywood, America, um, that sort of thing. And I think this 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 film was actually paying tribute. It was quite literally one of the first of its kind to do an homage to the insert cards, the old timey book turning um, title reel, um, and, and even the music. It was all playing back to that older day and age, but now in color. You know, now with Robert yeah. Redford. Yep. Uh, when so was the, the, the music bad... too was because there, there was also a, a time travel movie with uh, Christopher Reeve, wasn't there? Like around the same time, there was a bunch of stuff yeah. coming out talking about the earlier time period. Period. I can't remember off the top of my head. When, <laughs> when was the good debate? <coughs> uh, late sixties, wasn't it? Yes. So that basically takes that out of minds because yeah, you go the good, the bad, the ugly. Yeah, you can't actually mistake that, and that was before the seventies. So they're obviously. Yeah, I wouldn't really call that's a soundtrack. I wouldn't really call that a title song. It's not like somebody was playing the theme song to uh, the Good, the Bad, and the Ugly on your top forty radio. It wasn't that kind of a musical. Yeah, but view. it's mm -hmm. a it's a piece of music which during the the height or the the tension, high tension, like the graveyard scene. Right. Yeah. Well, uh, then also the uh, the waltz 
in 2001 is very similar. Uh, yeah. Sore throats, yeah. Yeah. So the as soon as you hear did. that, you immediately think 2001. Yeah. I don't. <laughs> That's well, only because not actually, everyone, Alec, of course. That's only because you got sweat sweat off your feet when you were a kid to the walls. <laughs> no, we'll no, we'll no talk about Jennifer Bluff flooding. <laughs> <laughs> Alec <laughs> is Derek. Oh, is that man make nightmares? <laughs> I can't even remember. That's for yours. <laughs> Eli Walsh was great in the, that. Yeah, I mean. Patton had a good soundtrack, but yeah, but it's the same idea. It's trying to find ones where the music was, even in the trailer, they played the music to that. Right. And and I think it was because the, uh, the music the industry, industry was solidifying in the 70s as a, as a true entity of industry. Uh, is that the one you were talking about time after time? And the Lone uh, Ranger doesn't count because the Lone Ranger the soundtrack was from a TV show, which I said TV shows did it because you used to hear it. So, right. hi ho, Silver! Right. You're going. <laughs> no, that was the William Tell Overture. That's the William Tell. That was the Lone Ranger uh, tune. The William yes, Tell the Lone Overture. Ranger stole it from William Tell. Yeah. yeah, that's what I'm saying. You look at that, then you've... Um, so, yes, the William Tell Overture was the Lone Ranger's theme tune. It's the same mm. as the Call of the Cuckoos. Is the Laurel Hardy theme tune. But you wouldn't class that, you wouldn't link it to a movie because they used it and everything because it was their theme tune. So any Lone Ranger movie, cartoon, TV show mm -hmm. had the William Tell Overture because it was the Lone Ranger. It's that type of thing, so... Yeah, Speaking. you know, and oh. uh, it, because of the Hollywood uh, studio system, there was a yeah. lot of times where the orchestra wasn't even credited. It was no. just the music, and it was, uh, and you you saw maybe the conductor's name and maybe the composer, mm -hmm. but it wasn't until the '60s and '70s that that all started to tear itself apart, and the studio system was kind of becoming. A, a group of independent contractors as opposed yeah. to single, uh, almost socialist entities. Um, and, it, you know, I'll remind everybody too that it wasn't until the 70s that people started talking about people like John Williams as an orchestra conductor, as a composer. I mean, yeah. people see John Williams' name and they're like, oh, the music is going to be great. Yeah. Um PJ, I can't actually pronounce this properly, but recently I've downloaded this uh, classical track, just put in private chat, because I can't pronounce it. I know it's got Spartacus. But speaking um, about that... Catatunini? Yeah. Now, I was listening to Classic FM the other day because apparently uh, one of the radio stations was playing up. And uh, put on Classic FM for a while, and then we heard this song. And then my mum turned around and went, No, that's from the TV show The OD in Line. And I went, Yeah, but it's not just related to that TV show. Now, you remember The OD in Line, don't you? Peter? You need, to, uh, yeah. Yeah. And my mum was going, No, that's The OD in Line. I went, No, it's actually a proper, you know, it's just a thing. About but that's that's music, the thing. You, there's a lot yeah. of music like that. Um, yeah. People refer to different music because, yeah. like, you look at the Exorcist theme tune, right? Mm -hmm. the bells, How yeah. many people refer to it as the Exorcist theme tune oh, no. instead of tubular bells? Yeah, you know I mean, good point, Melvin. Yeah, yeah, I mean, so it's that thing. Yeah, and I, yeah. I found the name of that movie. I'm just going to put it in the. But that's what I'm saying. You think about it. We we all do it because you've got your name of a yeah. particular piece of music. It's not necessarily the name of the music. It's the name it's known by. Like the William, the Lone Ranger theme tune is the William Tell Overture. Mm. I knew I'll spit it, but <laughs> you can't hold it to that. Uh, that's good, Kelly. John Williams... Lost in Space and Jane I mean, Eyre. Jane Eyre, I didn't know that. 
Well, I actually knew about Lost in Space. I didn't know that about Genia. But there you go. Anyway, I'm going to actually start rounding off because yes. back to work for my last day tomorrow before I go on holiday. Yeehaw! Remember, yep. boys and girls, lads and lasses, ladies and gents, Jim is on the hot seat for Saturday, the next mm. two Saturdays, because I'll <laughs> not be around. <laughs> no, <laughs> as far as I'm aware, yeah, Mastermind is definitely <laughs> it. There's another one we know, Mastermind, I got it, Gene. <laughs> but next Wednesday, there is no TV show a review, movie review on. As far as I'm aware, mm-hmm. nobody's put anything forward when I'm not around. Maybe a good thing, maybe not. Depends how the next two Saturdays go. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be fun. <laughs> Won't it? As long as the design process self destruct button and we'll move yes. on. <laughs> but I will be away, so I'll have my iPad with me, so I'll be tuning in if mm-hmm. I'm sitting after a few beers and it's late at night. Oh, I'll be here all day. That's why I'm knackered. I need to get in my kit early for work tomorrow because I've got a long day ahead of me tomorrow because oh, a week and a bit mm-hmm. off. This room is getting tidied up. It's already started. I took somebody's advice and got a load of boxes and I've already started taking all the pictures off the wall. So Stephen has suggested the boxes. I thought, no, I'm not going to do that. Then I realised <laughs> I need to pack that in case it gets broken. I need to pack that in case it gets broken. I need to take all the pictures <laughs> up in case they get broken. I better get fucking boxes. But <laughs> I've already broken one picture and it's a picture I've broken twice in the last month. Well, I three weeks. Uh, the last three weeks, I've broken it twice. I broke the mm. frame and I bought a new frame. It's a thick frame because it's got a Lego piece, and I snap smashed it again by dropping an empty box on top of it. So I'm going to replace it, and then what I'm going to do when it's in a nice new frame is I'm going to give it away to my friend's daughter who mm. loves Spider Man because twice in three weeks. I think it's out the room in case it's... And I've got to say, thank you, PJ. When you send those DVDs down, Philip will be thanking you live. Not a problem. It's welcome. Because as I said... Yeah. I e- Even every so often I take my, my extras down to the charity shop. The Doctor mm-hmm. Who wants to stay there. Because the classic Doctor Who... Is... <laughs> I'm getting rid of nothing classic. So... It's there, um, and it's just when I was thinking about it, and because I'm tidying, and I know I've got a lot of doublers that I'll have to go back to the charity shop, and I need to clear space. So even those two discs is perfect. Yeah, so I'm glad he's. I'm glad he's not got them. He can have them because. Mm. Um, shall we have a tires? Or yes. What you? I'm going to let Stephen go first because he's probably got a lot on his list. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, I definitely got a few. Um, let's see. Uh, tonight, I'm going to be over at uh, Unbearable Seventy Three, which we know in the chat as uh, Thad. Um, and that's going to be uh, what we're doing a another uh, grumpier, not so old men kind of uh, channel. We're just going to be chewing the fat on some pop culture so issues. So you went off then... the grumpy old men channel, uh, the grumpier, not so old men's channel, right? <laughs> And that's in about five hours, uh, about 8 p.m. my time. So uh, that's early morning that's for you probably guys? probably about yeah. 3 o'clock in the morning our time. Okay. Yeah. Three and uh, then, of course, tomorrow we got Roman of the Empire is doing uh, the past and future of the Doctor Who universe. Uh, I'm going to be joining that. That's tomorrow, uh, uh, Roman's usual time at 5 p.m., uh, November 3rd. I, and that's uh, yeah. Pacific. And I'll be taking part in that um, to give my two cents about it. Yep. So and, that's uh, uh, 24 hours plus two. So just a couple hours yep. from now, same that, that time tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Perfect. Right. Uh, uh, FFFSI. On the 15th, we've still got the homage to the prisoner, which is coming together nicely, but I haven't finished the opening. I know. <laughs> But on the 29th of this month, in links or a sort of a promotion to the new film Troll, which is coming out on Netflix, we are looking into the film Troll Hunter, which was made back in 2010. So that will be on the 29th of this month. So please keep your eye out for that. Perfect. And 
thank you again, guys, for joining us for such another great movie. Oh, yes. Yeah. The Sting. And remember, ladies and gents, I'm not here for the next two Saturdays. You'll see me next in a fortnight for the Wednesday night show, which I'm just digging up in front of me because I think that will be, is it the Doctor Who one? No, it's not. It'll be the 16th, uh, the 15th, 16th. It'll be the 16th of November will be Tank Girl. You'll see me in two weeks' time, Wednesday, the 16th of November for Tank Girl. I will not be here for the next two Saturdays. That'll be Jim covering the Let's Talk Geeky. And the guys will obviously be there backing them up and keeping them awake. Mm -hmm. So, ladies and gents, boys and girls, thank you very much for joining us. And remember, I'm not old. I'm classic. PJ may be out. Turn up. Night. Mm -hmm.